Today I'm going to talk to you about the procedural environmental right to access to information as a pathway to corporate compliance, accountability and transparency in the Vile Triangle, South Africa. And I'm going to talk, tell you a story, a story about how the right to access to information provided for in the South African Constitution was invoked to pursue corporate environmental compliance in response to major concerns about pollution in one of the most polluted areas in South Africa. And I'll tell this story through the lens of the implementation of environmental constitutionalism, the recognition that the environment is a proper subject for protection in constitutional texts and for vindication by constitutional courts worldwide. That's according to James May and Aaron Daly. So who are the main characters in this story? Well, this is a story about a lion, the Val Environmental Justice Alliance, a community-based group established in 2004 as an advocate for environmental justice, with the object of responding to environmental health, water quality, air quality, and waste management issues in the Val that affect, in particular, the many impoverished communities in the area. It's also a story about a witch, Arcelor Mittal, with its steelworks in Vereniging and Van der Bell Park, being one of the most significant contributors to pollution in the Val. Arcelor Mittal has been found by the Department of Environmental Affairs to have repeatedly violated environmental laws in South Africa. Finally, it's a story about a wardrobe, the Val Triangle, about 60 kilometers south of Johannesburg, Gauteng, South Africa's most popular, populous and economically active province, is the industrial area known as the Val Tri Triangle, in which Vereniging and Van der Bell Park are located. The Val River flows through the area into the nearby Val Dam, an important source of drinking water for much of Gauteng. Worryingly, however, the area is one of the most polluted in South Africa. In 2006, it was the first part of the country to be declared a priority area under the National Environmental Management Air Quality Act, 39 of 2004, due to the ambient air quality standards in the area being particularly poor and detrimental to human health and the environment. Now, in the typical pattern of environmental injustice, Many impoverished communities live in this area. As at 2006, 46.1% of households lived in poverty and 479 of the population was unemployed. The area is thus one where environmentalism must respond to three of our greatest challenges. The struggle against racism, the struggle against poverty and inequality, and the struggle to protect the environment as the natural base on which all economic activity depends. So, once upon a time, in 2011, the Alliance began a campaign to gain access to records from ArcelorMittal, which would reveal whether or not the company had complied with its internal environmental requirements and strategy, as well as obligations imposed on it in terms of licenses issued by various government departments under various environmental legislation, including laws aimed at the prevention of pollution and the implementation of remediation measures. To seek access to ArcelorMittal's records, the Alliance asserted its constitutionally protected right to access to information. This is a right that is horizontally enforceable in South Africa as between private individuals. It's a right given effect by the Promotion of Access to Information Act 2 of 2000. And private individuals can seek access to the information of other private entities in circumstances where information is required for the protection of a right. The Alliance's request for records from ArcelorMittal was based on the public interest in the protection of the environmental right also a horizontally applicable, constitutionally protected right in South Africa. 
the alliance thus invoked two complementary rights in the South African Constitution. On the one hand, the right of access to information, and on the other, the right to an environment not harmful to health or well-being. It was able to do so because South Africa has constitutionalised environmental protection, not least by incorporating a rights-based approach to environmental governance. The Constitution includes not only a substantive environmental right, but also interrelated and mutually reinforcing substantive rights such as the right to life, the right to dignity, the rights to equality, water, food and housing, all of which have a direct bearing on the environment. In addition, the Constitution provides for procedural rights to access to information and to administrative justice, including in relation to environmental decision-making. In South Africa, these procedural rights have at least the capacity to facilitate participative, representative and transparent environmental governance as aspects of the evolving concept of environmental justice. Environmental constitutionalism ought to contribute towards South Africa's overall project of transformative constitutionalism. Since our constitution is overtly transformative in nature, as has been acknowledged by our constitutional court. They say that it demands a decisive break from and a ringing rejection of that part of our past which is disgracefully racist, authoritarian, insular and repressive. Now human rights scholars, lawyers and activists in South Africa continue to grapple with how to advance the project of transformative constitutionalism. However, very little has been said about the potential role of South African environmental law and governance in this project. I argue that this story is a step in the right direction towards environmental constitutionalism being utilised in a progressive and transformative manner that contributes towards our project of transformative constitutionalism. So let's get back to the story. In the face of the Alliance's request for access to information, instead of making the records requested available, ArcelorMittal disputed that the Alliance required the records requested for the protection of the environmental right. ArcelorMittal adopted an obstructive stance. Among other things, ArcelorMittal asserted that the Alliance was attempting to usurp government's role in monitoring, compliance and enforcement of environmental issues by seeking access to the requested records. Unsurprisingly, or at least thankfully, ArcelorMittal's arguments were rejected by the Supreme Court of Appeals judgment, written by one of the heroes of the story, Judge Nafsa. Judge Nafsa implemented environmental constitutionalism through a rights-based approach. On 26 November 2014, the Supreme Court of Appeal upheld the High Court's order in which ArcelorMittal was required to deliver the records requested by the Alliance within 14 days. Although the Supreme Court of Appeal's order entailed simply granting access to information, the Court's reasoning is to be applauded for a number of reasons. First of all, in the judgment, the environmental context was central rather than merely peripheral. NAVSA implemented environmental constitutionalism by placing the litigation in its proper environmental context. NAVSA did so by highlighting the significance of ArcelorMittal's acknowledged history of operational impact on the environment, stating, ArcelorMittal's industrial activities impacting as they do on the environment, including on air quality and water resources, has an effect on persons and communities in the immediate vicinity and is ultimately of importance to the country as a whole. Translated, this means that the public is affected and that ArcelorMittal's activities and the effects thereof are matters of public importance and interest. Put differently, the nature and effect of ArcelorMittal's activities are crucially important. ArcelorMittal is a major, if not the major, polluter in the area in which it conducts operations. NASA also wrote his judgment 
from the perspective of a need to reset our environmental sensitivity barometer, given the perils of global warming. The implementation of environmental constitutionalism was strengthened in his judgment because environmental harms caused by polluting industry and their impacts were placed at the center rather than viewed as peripheral or minor issues. The second way in which NASA's judgment was a good step towards the implementation of environmental constitutionalism is because he promoted the use of environmental legislation. Now, this is not something we see often or typically in litigation concerning the environment. Although he did not directly develop the content of the environmental right, NAVSA implemented environmental constitutionalism by traversing a number of provisions in South African environmental legislation that both implicitly and overtly pursue social justice and connect questions of participation and transparency to environmental protection. So NAVSA traversed a number of the justice-oriented principles in NEMA, the National Environmental Management Act 107 of 1998, which is our framework environmental legislation and these principles are intended to give content to the constitutionally entrenched notion of sustainable development through procedural and substantive protections. Two of the principles which NAVSA found to be significant focus on participation and the interconnectedness of the environment and people. And they arguably encapsulate an expansive understanding of environmental justice as described by David Schlossberg and David Caruthers, that goes beyond the unjust distribution of environmental goods and bads, and also addresses recognition, authentic inclusion and in political participation, and does so in relation to a broad array of peoples and interests, and various capabilities necessary for individuals and communities to be free, equal and functioning. Relying on principles from NEMA, NAVSA acknowledged the legitimate role of the Alliance as a genuine advocate for environmental justice that is entitled to monitor the operations of ArcelorMittal. By casting the Alliance in this role and giving them a seat at the table, NAVSA affirmed the value of participation by members of the public and non-government organizations in environmental management and accountability. The final way in which NAVSA implemented environmental constitutionalism was by extending the potential application of NEMA's justice-oriented principles to corporations. In particular, NAVSA highlighted the principle which demands that environmental decisions must be taken in an open and transparent manner and access to information must be provided in accordance with the law. He held that although the provision rate relates principally to the state, it must in principle apply to corporate decisions and activities that impact on the environment and thus implicate the public interest, particularly when their activities require regulatory approval. Now, whilst it's uncontroversial that the provisions of the Promotion of Access to Information Act and the Administrative Justice Act may apply to corporations, the extension of the application of NEMA's environmental principles to the private sphere is a significant development in NAVSA's judgment, consistent with a growing acceptance of the need for transnational corporations to respect and protect human rights, including in relation to the environment. This development indicates that in South Africa, the implementation of environmental constitutionalism implicates not only government, but also private actors. In the South African context, the idea of corporate accountability is linked to the pursuit of social justice and is given constitutional recognition through the horizontal application of rights. While there's little jurisprudence on the topic of horizontal application of rights, Diksha Barna explains, 
The power wielded by private actors is often comparable to, if not greater than, that of the state itself. For the most part, the current distribution of wealth and the resulting power dynamics within the private market is a product of the socio-political as well as the legal structures of the apartheid regime. The law cannot tolerate a perpetuation of the apartheid legacy by virtue of continuing pre-constitutional socio-economic power relations in the private arena. So by implementing environmental constitutionalism so as to reinforce the notion of corporate accountability, NAFSA arguably responded to what Jacqueline Koch describes as capital's logic of accumulation that is destroying the ecological conditions that sustain life through the pollution and consumption of natural resources, destruction of habitats and biodiversity, and global warming. Although NAVSA did not expressly engage with the horizontal application of the environmental right linked to the right to access to information, he implicitly supported su such application through his forceful remark that Corporations operating within our borders, whether local or international, must be left in no doubt that in relation to the environment, in circumstances such as those under discussion, there is no room for secrecy and that constitutional values will be enforced. The court thus acknowledged that environmental constitutionalism is not only implemented through the disclosure of information by government, but also by private actors who first hold immense power, second are capable of reaping significant environmental harm in their pursuit of profits, and third arguably owe stronger duties to disclose information in those circumstances. So is there a happily ever after? Well, as a result of the ways in which NAVSA implemented environmental constitutionalism, by reasoning substantively in the enforcement of the right to access to information, linking that right to the right to an environment not harmful to health or well-being, this story is a good illustration of how a procedural right can operate so as to keep a substantive environmental right vital. It took the Alliance roughly four years of litigating to achieve this feat. The end result was, however, one that arguably strengthened the implementation of environmental constitutionalism in South Africa and contributed towards its project of transformative constitutionalism. Following the litigation, during 2015, the records that formed the subject of the litigation were made public. As a result, the Alliance and the public more generally could better determine whether or not to take further legal action against ArcelorMittal to hold it accountable for environmental non-compliance. To date, no further litigation has been instituted, though government continues to exercise its statutory powers in relation to non-compliance. The potential to pursue further litigation is not the only value of a judgment like this, however. As explained by a survey of the Pia Civil Society Network on, among other things, South Africa's access to information culture, the right to access to information seems to be more at risk in South Africa today than ever before. Within this context, the need for information activism and promoting awareness and use of PAJA in order to strengthen the right to know, seems increasingly pressing. Now these words point to the intrinsic value of stories like these in facilitating the pursuit of a culture of transparency and openness in South Africa by raising awareness and promoting the use of the Promotion of Access to Information Act. This value contributes towards social justice, equality and dignity by empowering those affected by environmental harm to take action to protect the environments in which they exist and pursue a more just and equitable society that promotes rather than impairs their dignity. Arising from the litigation, ArcelorMittal published a summary report outlining its past and current environmental issues and the steps it has taken to comply with environmental laws. Although the summary report obviously takes the form of a public relations exercise for ArcelorMittal, 
its existence suggests a greater level of corporate accountability and responsiveness to environmental harms and the people they impact. The events following the litigation illustrate some of the advantages of implementing environmental constitutionalism by invoking the right to access to information in litigation aimed, ultimately, at environmental protection. Particularly given the horizontal application of rights in South Africa, where the litigation is successful, it can have the effect of instilling greater levels of corporate accountability and responsiveness to environmental harm and benefit communities affected thereby. This kind of story encourages self-regulation and promotes a culture of corporate environmental compliance. It empowers the public by informing them about the environmental risks to which they may be exposed giving them avenues to compel the state to order the taking of remedial and other measures. The story illustrates the effective implementation of environmental constitutionalism by pursuing and exercising participatory rights that will inure to the benefit not only of the environment, but of civil society as a whole. By implementing environmental constitutionalism so as to hold private actors to account, in respect of an underlying environmental evil, the culture of environmental non-compliance that secrecy facilitates, not just a failure to provide access to information, is mitigated. There is, of course, however, no such thing as a happily ever after, as impoverished communities in the Val Triangle continue to experience environmental injustice on a daily basis, despite the success story. Nevertheless, certainly, the Alliance efforts served to empower the community and promote corporate accountability in relation to polluting activities. Thus, stories like the one I've told tell us something valuable about how to embark upon a pathway towards the world we want. And you can read the, the judgment of NAVSA in the VAL Environmental Justice Alliance that you'll find with this PowerPoint. Thank you.